Good morning. Let's do that again. Good morning. Amen. What an exciting day to be in the house of the Lord. We want to share with you this morning a song that we'll do it in a couple of weeks as we meet in that Eastern Medical. You pulled me from darkness and clothed me in garments of praise. Jesus forever, my song will be in only for you. Living in freedom, you've taken my burdens away. Jesus forever, my song will be in only for you. For the cross that you bore and the debt that you paid, for the victory you won over death and the grave. This is the reason I sing, for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring, for the promise that heaven is waiting for me. This is the reason I sing. God calls us to sing in His greatness. I will not be silent. I'll testify of Your grace. Jesus forever, my song will be new. Only for You. For the cross that You bore and the debt that You paid for the victory You won. This is the reason I sing For the hope that you give And the joy that you bring For the promise that heaven is waiting for me This is the reason I sing So good, so good He's so good to me Forever I'll sing You're so good to me So good, so good You're so good to me Forever I'll sing You're so good to me For the cross that you bore and the death that you paid For the victory you won over death and the grave This is the reason I sing For the hope that you give and the joy that you bring For the promise that heaven is waiting for me This is the reason I sing For the cross that you bore from the choir of our musical that will be printed and presented on Sunday night, the 24th, Palm Sunday night, 6 o'clock. Hope you're going to plan to be present. It's going to be a wonderful night of worship, and I encourage you to come bring somebody with you. It's a joy to welcome you to Calvary Baptist this morning. So glad that you're here. Did you survive the time change? It looks like some of our folks did not. 
Nevertheless, I'm glad that you're here. We welcome you. If you're a guest with us, we're certainly honored by your presence this morning. And there is a portion of the bulletin that I'd love for you to fill out and place in the collection plate when it comes by. It's on the right-hand leaflet of your bulletin. And if you'll fill that out and place it in the collection plate, it helps us, helps us get to know you better, helps us get a little information about you. And so if you'll do that for us today, we would deeply appreciate it. On the back page of your bulletin, you'll make note of the, uh, some of the activities surrounding our Easter season. And uh, if you'll notice on the 24th, we will have our night of worship. We're going to have a finger food fellowship following. So plan to stay and plan to bring your favorite fellow, uh, foods, uh, if you will. On Easter Sunday, we will have our small groups and worship as we usually do, regular schedule Easter Sunday morning. And uh, let me just mention on Palm Sunday, that's the 24th, Sunday morning, we will have the Lord's Supper. And so please make note of that. It won't be on Easter Sunday morning, it'll be on Palm Sunday morning that we have the Lord's Supper. I want to commend you in your giving to our annual missions offering if you'll notice at the very bottom of the back page, you'll notice the, uh, the total missions receipt, receipts to date is $33,601.50. So we're about $6,062 or $300 uh, uh, from our goal of $40,000. If you've not given to the missions offering, you'll certainly <coughs> want to do that. And I'm praying God will give us the victory in that. We will receive this offering through Easter Sunday or through the end of the month, and then we're going to send it to where it needs to be. So keep that in mind. If you can do more or if you'd like to give and haven't given, please do so. I'm very proud of, of you, and uh, you know when you add up all that was given on the mission march last Sunday, others have given through the year. Uh, we have online giving, in which, was, which, which was a blessing. And uh, then we had our missions auction. You remember that? And so when you add it all together, that's what you have is 33,601.50. And so we're marching to 40,000. I'm, I'm praying God's going to give us the victory in that. I love you. It's good to see you this morning. Let's bow for our prayer, and we'll worship the Lord together. Father, it's good to come together today. <clears throat> I'm so thankful for the opportunity to gather with your people here at Calvary. <coughs> I love to worship you. I love to worship here. I love to worship with these brothers and sisters in Christ. And I pray, Father, you'll bless the worship today. I pray you'll be glorified and honored through the singing and the preaching of your word. We come with an attitude of humility. We come with a voice of praise. We come to exalt the holy name, the name that is above every name, that's the name Jesus. It is in his name I pray. Amen. Is God good? Yes. I love that part of that song that we just sang. He says he's so good, so good, so good to me. Amen. That I'm just a man, amen. Just one of his many creations, but he's so good to us. So let's stand, let's sing this song. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me his love. Oh, 
There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. How do I know that? Because his love letter to me tells me so.
far beyond what we deserve. So this morning we give you praise and you can eat for that. Thank you for your goodness toward us. We just want to humbly come and say, tell you as a, as a child to a father, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Father, pray that you would receive the, the praise and the honor and the glory. But Father, each heart, each tongue, each voice has raised in this room today. Father, thank you for your word that guides us, gives us security in who you are and who we are in you. So, Father, thank you for an abundant, clear word that you've left for us, your love letter to us. Father, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Please take your Bibles this morning and turn to Psalm 8. Psalm 8. And you know that the book of Psalms are songs. That's what the word psalm means. And so we're going to look at song number 8 today. And I hope you'll keep your Bible open. I'll refer to the text many times today. And the outline is provided for you in your bulletin. Follow along as I read the text, please. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. That's where we're asked the question we're asking today. What is man? Verse number five. For you have made him a little lower than the angels and you've crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beast of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. We're going to consider this wonderful psalm today. The name of the message is, What is Man? Can I tell you next Sunday, I plan to preach a sermon entitled, Why Christians Should Say No to Gambling. That message has been conceived and born in my heart. I'm putting the finishing touches before I present her to you. I hope you'll come. I'm going to be sharing with you why Christians should say no to gambling. Psalm chapter 8, what is man? I read about a psychologist that was walking along the beach in Hawaii and saw a bottle sticking up out of the sand, picked it up, opened it up, and a genie came out. And the genie said, thank you for releasing me for your kindness. I will grant you one wish. The surprised and somewhat skeptical psychologist said, I've always wanted a road from Hawaii to California. The Jenny grimaced, thought a moment and said, listen, I'm sorry, but I can't do that. Think of all the pilings needed to hold up the highway and how tall they would have to be to reach the bottom of the ocean. Think of all the pavement that would be needed. I'm just sorry that's just too hard for me. Okay, said the psychologist. I have a wish then that would help me with my work. Help me understand my patience. Help me understand why they laugh and cry. Why they're so temperamental and can be so hard to work with. More importantly, help me know what they really want. Tell me what makes man tick. And the genie paused for a moment and said, on that highway you want two lanes or four. <laughs> man is complex the genie was right it would be easier to build a highway from Hawaii to California than to know what makes man tick it appears that the psalmist who is David here is considering something like this in this psalm. He writes there in verse 3, When I consider. His thoughts are deep and broad. He's attempting to figure out man's place upon this earth. He asks there in verse 4, What is man? That's the question I want to consider this morning. From this psalm, I, I found three things about man that I want you to consider by way of outline today. First of all, would you consider man's perplexity? Perplexity. 
Here the psalmist David compares and contrasts the weakness of man with the greatness of God. I noticed in verse 4, we find two Hebrew words that are translated man. The first one is the Hebrew word enosh. It speaks of man's weakness. David writes, what is Enosh? What is man? Again, speaking of man's weakness. The psalmist is asking, what is it about weak man that God, you would even be mindful of him or even think of him? The other word is Hadam. It says, and the son of Man, the son of Adam. From that we get our English word Adam. But it speaks of God's offspring, the son of man that you visit him. It speaks again of God's offspring. David calls uh, him the son of man. He's asking what is it about your created offspring that you would give him your attention and your care. Then David compares and contrasts the picture of the weak man to the, creation, to the greatness of God. I see this in verse 1b and in verse 3. Notice verse 1. Who have set your glory above the heavens. Verse 3. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have ordained. Here he's comparing and contrasting Enosh, weak man, with the greatness of God. I want to tell you the greatness of God has left David in awe and in wonder. Scholars believe that David probably wrote this psalm at nighttime because he makes reference to the moon and the stars and he mentions the fingers of God. And that refers to the actual work of God in creation. The word ordained there means to establish or to fix. God, you see, created. God fixed it all in its place. I read that with the naked eye, you can see about 5,000 stars. And that's what David saw when he would look up into the heavens. Did you know early astronomers saw about a half dozen stars that did not march in lockstep with the others? But instead, they seemed to meander all over the place. The Greeks finally called these stars wanderers, believing they were errant stars that had some way lost their way in the universe. The Greek word for wandering is planeo, and from that word we get our English word planet. Yeah, in the ancient days when they saw what they believed to be wandering stars, it was the planets. They could only see with the naked eye. I read that with a four-inch telescope, you can see about two million stars. With a 200-inch mirror telescope and a great observatory, you can see more than a billion stars. Folks, our universe is so large that if you were to travel at the speed of light, it would take you 40 billion years to reach the edge of the universe. Consider the heavens as David is doing. It is ginormous. And David could see the designer behind the design. He could see the gardener behind the garden. According there, verse 1b, he knew the glory of God, and he knew that the glory of God even expanded all of that. It expanded all the heavens. I found the quote by John Glenn speaking from his view 
there in the spacecraft discovery. This is what he said, to look at the window as I did the first day, to look out at this kind of creation and not believe in God is near to me impossible. I want you to notice the comparison, the contrast here between weak man and the greatness of God. When David looked at the vastness and the splendor of the universe, to him, human beings seem so small and insignificant. So David asked, what is weak man, sick man, sinful man, mortal man compared to God in all of his greatness? What is man? Charlie W. Shedd, a Presbyterian minister and writer of the last century, tells about a seminary experience. He was an excellent student. He was well liked. But as he approached the end of his studies, he seemed to believe and like himself a little bit too much according to one of his professors. And so his professors noticed it, called him up to the front of the room and then called another young man in the room up. You see, Charlie Shedd was very tall and this young man was the shortest in the class. And he said to those two young men, I hope that you, when you get to Colorado to preach for your own good together, stand at the foot of Pike's Peak and notice that compared to that mountain, neither of you are very large. And that's what David the psalmist is saying here. When you compare yourself to holy, majestic creator, you're left perplexed. Why would God care about lowly man? Why would God even think about lowly man? Why would God care when he's so majestic and great and man is so lowly and man is so sickly, man is so weak? It appears to me that David got no answer to his perplexing question. No help for his perplexity. He was just left in wonder. He was just left in awe. He was just left in great humility. Now listen to this. Out of that awe and out of that humility comes praise. Twice he writes or he sings, Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name. See that word excellent right there? It means majestic. It means wide. It means far. It means great. From the very beginning, he gets this idea of magnifying. So the psalmist begins to magnify this great God of the heavens that he has envisioned. Now let me show you something else. There in verse 2. Look at what it says. Why in the world would this be in this great psalm or song? Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. Why is that in there? Hey, let me take you to the New Testament. Matthew 21, 15 to 16. As Jesus finished cleansing the temple and the people shouted, Hosanna. And the religious leaders were indignant toward him. He quoted this psalm saying, Have you never read that out of the mouths of babes and infants you have perfected praise? Jesus ties these words to praise. David is using them here to speak of praise. As David considers the weakness of man and the greatness of God, he can't help but praise God. Folks, David loved to worship. According to Psalm 119, verse 164, he intentionally worshiped God seven times a day. He was as disciplined in his worship as he was as a warrior. Now, folks, I've got to say that should be the response of all men. God, in his greatness, is worthy to be praised. Charles Wesley knew this truth. Hey, he wrote his first hymn 
three months after his conversion. His first hymn was entitled, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. He went on to write 6,500 hymns. Folks, we're always going to be perplexed over the grace of God, over how much he could love and care for us as weak man in all of his greatness. We don't know why he loves us like he does. All we can do is praise his name. That's, that's man's perplexity. Number two, let's consider man's position. You see, the psalmist here tells us of a special position given to man in God's created order. Say, preacher, where do you find that? Verse five. Look at what it says. For you have made him a little lower than the angels. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. The psalmist here is speaking of a special position. And did you notice he says he's made us a little bit lower than the angels. Now some translations use the term or the phrase heavenly beings. The writer of Hebrews quotes this text to describe the incarnation of Christ. When Christ came, he was made a little lower than the angels, the writer of Hebrews says. And the writer of Hebrews uses the word angelos. We talked about it in another series. Angelos, which means messenger or angel. But listen, I've noticed something here. Here in Psalm 8, David did not use the word angelos or angel. He used the Hebrew word, listen to this, Elohim, which is plural for God. It's the name of God. We have been made a little lower than God. It has been said, this statement is so bold, the translators starting with the Greek translation in the third century B.C. and coming all the way to the NIV translation have substituted the word angelos or angels or heavenly beings with God. So if you've got another text that talks about angels or heavenly beings, you need to write God there. We've been made a little bit lower than Elohim. God himself. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, that regenerated man will one day judge the angels. Listen to me, friend. Man will never be God. Man will never be a little God. Man is not God but man is created a little bit lower than God. That's man's special position in God's created order. Now our culture today wants us to believe that we evolved from another animal life form. I read about a little girl who asked her daddy how the human race came about. He said, oh, that's easy. God created Adam and Eve, and they had children, and that's how the human race began. A couple of days later, she asked her mother the same question, and the mother said, oh, that's simple. A long time ago, there were eight men, and we evolved from them. And the girl was confused, so she went back to her daddy and asked, how come you said we're created by God and mom says we evolved from ape men? And the father said, that's because she told you about her side of the family and I told you about my side of the family. <laughs> Friend, listen, the next time somebody tells you that mankind has evolved from an ape, why don't you tell them that your side of the family... Your side of the family was created by God. Tell them, that must be your side of the family. Let me tell you about mine. 
We're created just a little bit lower than God himself. But there's more here. Not only did God give us this position. Listen, he settled it. And he, and he sealed it with his glory. Yeah, it's in the second part of verse 5. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. The word glory there is the word kabod. And it means something of great worth or value or weight. Folks, God has crowned us and sealed us with great weight and great value. God has given us a favored position in his created order and then surrounded us with his glory, giving man great worth, giving man great wealth or weight and glory. This is our position. We are given great weight and worth and value. I heard about a preacher of old by the name of William L. Stinger. He wrote this little poem. Then to complete God's creation plan, in his own image God made man and signed his name with strokes most sure. Man is God's greatest signature. So friend, listen. That's who you are. That's your place in God's created order. He has created you just a little bit lower than himself and then he has sealed your position by give, with his glory, giving you weight and giving you worth and giving you value. But I can't stop there. There's something else I must say. There is created order and then there is redeemed man. There's man in his created order, but there's also redeemed man. And you know what John says about redeemed man? I found it in Revelation 1.6. Jesus has made us kings and priests unto God our Father. Folks, he has created us a little bit lower than God. He has given us great value and worth. But he has redeemed us into royalty in God's kingdom. We are kings and priests in his kingdom. During the bloody days of the French Revolution, a mob took the life of King Louis XVI and his queen, Marie Antoinette. They shouted to the guillotine with Dauphin, their young son and heir to the throne. But someone says, wait, don't do that. He'll just go to heaven. I've got a better idea. Let's give him over to old Meg. Widely known as the vilest woman in Paris. Let her clothe him in rags. Feed him from the filth of the streets. Let her teach him to steal and curse. Let old Meg damn his soul to hell. And that's what they did. But it is said there were a few days or there were days when the treatment was worse. And she forced him to say some vile word or act some vile way. And Dolphin would clinch his little royal fist. And he would stomp his little royal foot. And he would say, I will not do it. I will not do it. I was born to be a king. I will not do it. Friend, listen. When Satan, our enemy, comes to tempt us and he tells us we're a nobody and he surrounds us with doubt, let's just remind him who we are. Let's clench our kingly fist. Let's, let's tap her or stomp our, our little royal feet and let's tell the devil who we are. Let's tell him we're created just a little bit lower than God. Let's tell him that we have been given great worth and value by God himself. Tell him you have been born a king in God's kingdom. Tell him who you are. 
That is our position. Makes you feel pretty good, doesn't it? Third and finally, let's consider man's purpose. Not only man's perplexity and position, but how about his purpose? I found it in verse 6. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. Look at this, to put all things under his feet. Now listen, man has dominion over all the created order. But verse B, when it talks about all things under his feet, that's taken off the battlefield. It's the picture of a conquering king knocking down his enemies in battle and then going to them and putting his foot over their neck or behind their neck in defeat and conquering them. And what the psalmist is talking about here is that mankind is to take control of created order. He is to minister or administer the created order for God. We have a purpose for being here. We're not just here to breathe air. We're not just here to take up some space. God has put us here for a purpose. And if I were to summarize in today's vernacular what the psalmist is saying, I would say this. We are to take control of created order and we are to make a difference. That's it. We're to make a difference for God. That's why he's given us dominion. That's why he's given us dominion that we might, that we might make a difference. I read about a young man that once complained to his pastor about the condition of the world. He said, I could make a better world myself. <laughs> and the pastor replied, that's just what God wants you to do. That's our purpose. Make a difference. In the novel, The Perils of Eden. Aiden waited on Mavern, patiently by the fire. His silence only made the time pass more slowly. What was he listening for? Only the wind dared speak. Would his commission come from the mountain's breath? Would the north or the east call his name? How would he know when to begin his pilgrimage? How would he know which way to go? And when he could stand it no longer, he said to his mentor, when will I begin? And Mavern said, now. And Aiden then said, and which way should I go? And Mar Maven said, anywhere there's not a path. And suddenly Aiden realized that all through the night of silence there by the fire, he was waiting on Mavern, but Mavern was waiting on him. And that's the way it is with us. We keep waiting on a word. We keep waiting on a word from God that he's already given to us. Some of us here today, we're waiting on God to give us a word, but he's waiting on us. He's already said what to do. He's already said where to go. Go and make a difference. Do it now. That's our purpose. He's already told us what to do. Well, I've got to conclude. We've considered this morning one of the great questions of mankind. What is man? Well, preacher, that's a deep philosophical message. Is it really? That's not really a hard question when you got the word of God. I'll give you a hard question. If Cinderella's shoe fit her so perfectly, why did she lose it? <laughs> now that's a deep philosophical question. What is man? The answer is only found here in God's word and it's found here in God's word because it is truth. It's authored by the only one who was present at the time. It's authored by the only one who was an eyewitness. 
And he reveals what man is right here in Psalm chapter 8. What is man that, man that, we would be, that God would be mindful of him? What is man that God would care for him? Folks, man is God's crowning jewel of creation. That ought to make you feel good today. It makes me feel good. And that ought to make us want to give praise and glory to God. But listen, let me say this as I close. As much as God loves man, as much as we recognize he is the apex of God's creation, man cannot relate to holy God except through Jesus Christ. God is holy. And he cannot be approached by sinful mankind. Only through the blood of Jesus Christ can man be forgiven and come to God and relate to God and live with God for all eternity. This coming to God through Jesus Christ we call it salvation. We call it being saved. We call it being converted. We call it being born again. But it is where a relationship with God begins. You cannot relate to holy God who loves you except through Jesus Christ. I read about a sailor that once was left in charge of the helm with directions from the captain to keep his eye on a certain star and to steer that vessel directly towards it. He promised that he would do that. The captain went below, fell asleep, and after a while he awoke, came back on deck, and found the vessel sailing in the exact opposite direction in which he had told the, the helmsman to steer. And he asked him, what have you done? And the sailor replied, Captain, you got to pick out another star. I done sailed clear by that one. <laughs> Friend, listen. Before you sail past the revelation of God, before you sail past the glory of his creation, before you sail past the word of God, before you sail past this sermon today and end up in a sinner's hell, why don't you give your heart to Jesus Christ? There is no other star. And if you go by that star, you will go into an eternity without him. Don't pass the star of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. Thank you for its truth and all oh, how we see clearly from your word. Man's place, man's position, man's purpose. We thank you for creating us. Give us that desire to know you. Give us that desire to trust in you through Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, that if there's one here today or one listening to us by live stream or through the other ways this week, I pray you'll touch them with your convicting power that they might give their life to you as holy and great as you are. And even as much as you love mankind, we recognize that in our sinfulness we cannot relate to you as holy God, but we can through the shed blood of Jesus. Oh, may we recognize the only way we can relate and fellowship and know you is through Jesus Christ. And I pray you'll call us to come and follow Jesus. It is in his name I pray. Now heads about our eyes closed. I'm going to stand here at the front. If you're not a Christian, I want to invite you to come and give your life to Jesus today. Don't go past that star. It's the only star. Come and say, Brother Matt, I want Jesus in my heart. I'm ready to turn from my sin. I'm ready to trust in Jesus and his death on Calvary and his shed blood that I would be forgiven of my sins. I'll lead you in a prayer. 
of repentance and of trusting in the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'll help you call on the name of the Lord. If you'll come to me during this invitation. You can say, Brother Matt, I'm already a Christian, member of another church, but I want to come and join Calvary. Oh, we'd love to have you. You come to me during this invitation. We'll open the doors of the church and receive you into the fellowship. And then finally, the altar is open for you to come and pray. I hope you worship and praise him right now. When you think of how great he is, and he loves and cares for little old you and little old me, you can't help but trust him. You can't help but praise him. You can't help but give him glory. Praise him. Praise him. Let's stand together. You come. Close to